All right. Uh, good afternoon. Thanks for joining, Kyle. Um, we had uh, connected through, I guess, a mutual friend the other day, uh, Robin, and he had asked if I had some time to uh, sit down with you and uh, talk a little bit more about your calls and uh, what you've got going on there. So I guess uh, you know, introduce yourself. Um, is it the Parent Safety Alliance right you're with? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, my name is Kyle from Tucker, Georgia, I'm just northeast of the Atlanta area. Um, my kids happen to attend a private school in DeKalb County that is um, not part of the public school system. And back in um, late May, early June, when all of the news stories came out regarding the Uvalde massacre and all the stuff that happened there, and I won't go into detail, but that, that turned into a mission that I didn't realize how big it was and how mu many facets and how many different areas of school safety that were combined to create the environment that our children learn in. Um, a lot of people drop their kids off at school. They go on to work and don't really think twice about the day that happens for their children at school. And during my conversations with the private school principal, she informed me that any changes that she would like to make, even if it was up to her, would all have to be approved through their governing body, which in my kid's case happens to be the Archdiocese of Atlanta. They have 17 schools that are all within the, their, their Catholic school network in the Atlanta area. But during my research, I found out that there's over 192 private schools just in the metro Atlanta area. And further in my research, I found, after speaking with the police chief for DeKalb County Schools, that not only do the private schools have no coverage from the school resource officers, but not only that, but the elementary schools don't have any either in the public school system. And I started thinking to myself and my wife, we were, and I were talking, and she said, we just need to expand this entire movement, not just for private schools, but for all schools, because every single parent should be able to go to work every day and concentrate on making money for their family. And kids should be able to go to school every day and teachers, not just kids, the teachers, the administrators, the bus drivers, all the people that are involved in making a school day happen for these kids. They all need to be safe also. And they shouldn't be um, asked to arm themselves and all of a sudden become a defense against outside forces at the schools. I think that it's the, the duty of our government. We all pay taxes regardless of what school that our kids go to, whether it's private or public. We all pay property taxes, and that means that we should have full access to security at school, no matter which school it is in the county. So this mountain got bigger and bigger and bigger as more and more doors were opening and we'd make a little bit of progress. I would find the bureaucracy of government um, just, find, just throw blockade after blockade and obstacle after obstacle for someone like me to attempt to make any change. And the louder I would scream, the more blocks they would throw up. And I finally said, you know what, I'm not going to stop this until I get to the finish line because the more angry I would get after every time they would try to block me, it would become more of a mission. And I've got a ton of parents in the DeKalb County, Atlanta metro area, and the purpose that I was thinking of going on your show would be to expand our membership network and have as many parents as possible know about the, I would say, I don't want to say like the pitfalls or the, um, the, 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 down, the, the, the downfalls of our school system. It's just something they haven't paid attention to until recently, until, until someone brought it to their attention, that the priority not, needs to be not on new fancy stadiums and, you know, new – new um, sports equipment and new, you know, facilities necessarily. First of all, you need to secure the facilities to exist. You need to make sure that all the camera systems that, that already are installed are working. You need to make sure that every lock and every door for the classrooms and exterior entry and exit doors at a school close and shut to where they can't be jimmied open from the outside easily. They need to have software that has just come out that will allow someone to be that's carrying a weapon for the, the image that goes onto the cameras that already exist in their network. This new software that can come out can alert them that somebody is approaching the school with a weapon before they get to the door. 
They should have a police officer that has all the necessary equipment in case there is a bad actor that comes near a school to be ready with an SUV or a truck or something outside that's visible. This will serve as a deterrent for anybody who wants to come onto those campuses to just keep on moving and go somewhere else where the children are not at. It, we've seen as, as the common denominator all of these different events that have been happening is they're all cowards, and all they will do is attack places that can't defend themselves. And that would, in this case, be the elementary schools in DeKalb County and the, the, the daycares, churches, anywhere that has a private school. There is no coverage whatsoever with the county police. And if you look at the research that's been done by all the studies, the average response time, if you were to call 911 right now in my area, the very, very best you can expect is five to seven minutes. And that's if they're in the area. So because there's a shortage of police officers, we don't have the best case scenario. Chances are it's going to be more like 10 to 45 minutes before anyone shows up. And that's exactly what happened in Uvalde. Further, when they, all the different municipalities did show up, they were all confused and didn't know who was the site commander. That is an absolute unforgivable flaw that cannot happen again. Every single police officer and, and first responder needs to know who's in charge before they get to the site. Thirdly, I'd like to make sure that all of the parents that are involved in Parent Safety Alliance get a monthly update from all of the school administrators and the Board of Education to let us know what plans they have in place, what improvements are being done, what progress we've made. Because the longer we sit around at complacency and, and not be vigilant, the more we're going to become a target by these crazy people. The other thing I wanted to suggest is that every single kid in middle school and high school gets a social media screening that is a, a, a mandatory thing to happen. And I don't mean deep, in, deep into their privacy. I mean just look for the, the, the things that get posted on social media that are red flags. We don't want to know about their private conversations with their girlfriend. We want to know if they're posting parade routes or showing uh, swastikas or some kind of, you know, blood and gore kind of stuff on their social media. Do they have the, the telltale signs of someone that is going off the rails mentally. All of this stuff is things that have to be done. And I'm fighting to make sure the Parent Safety Alliance implements those changes. And we also want to approach, I know you mentioned before our call that you want to know where the funding is going to come from. I have a proposal to present to the governor of, of, of Georgia, Governor Kemp, that allow, there is over $5 billion with a B, not million, $5 billion in undesignated funds that are over and beyond the rainy day fund and the savings that the state is required to keep on hand. This is money that before the election, Governor Kemp will for sure designate that to his buddies and his friends that own companies to do infrastructure projects and things like that. But I am demanding that at least one billion, a very small percentage, just 20% of what's laying around, get put into school safety in the state. And it needs to be allocated evenly and equitably so no one says, oh, well, only that school got help and this school didn't. I want every school to get it. And any kind of church or daycare or anyone that applies and fills out the proper paperwork that takes care of kids on a daily basis needs to have this coverage. This is a basic thing. These children are our future. We have no future without them. And if anybody says, like yourself, you told me that you don't have kids, well, sir, these are going to be the mayors of your town. These are going to be the future police officers and teachers. These are the kids that are going to be serving you when you're too old to take care of yourself. So all of us need to be united in this. The other thing that's key about our movement is it doesn't discriminate against anything. This is a uniting movement. We all have children. It doesn't matter if you're your color, your creed, your race, any of your beliefs, all of that. It doesn't matter about your gender. We all love children. So if we can figure this out with the kids, I think that that would be a stepping stone to figure other stuff out that's divisive in our society. We all need to really wake up right now. And all, everyone needs to understand that if our children get massacred when they're at school, more and more kids are going to go into homeschool. And that's going to keep them from interacting with children, from growing as kids, becoming their personality that, that, that they're meant to be, because they're going to be introverts and scared to interact with people if they don't ever grow up with other children. They can't just sit in the house all the time. And also we need to get kids off of these screens and off of social media and make them play sports or do some outside activity that, enc that encourages them to exercise and be interactive with their friends. We can't allow people to sit on social media and be fed all of this, this garbage that is being fed to them through all these different channels that we can't keep control of. We've got other countries that are 
own things like TikTok and all these social media that's just stealing our kids' data and building profiles on our children. And all of this type of stuff is preventable. It makes no sense that we just allow all of this, this, this evil to fester. And we have to take, this, take care of this now. I mean, it's 2022, almost 2023, and if one more of these, things, these, these extreme events happen in my area, I'm telling you, parents are going to lose their mind. I mean, we all have, need peace of mind. We all need to not have anxiety about our children going to school. And the simple way is the, is the solution is prevention. Proactive accountability is what these government officials must have. They, even if they don't have kids, even if they're too old to have kids, they still serve us, and we're the voters. And if you look at the surveys, gen, gen, Generation Z, if you ask them, like, what their number one issue is, over 82% of them rated number one issue that they want fixed is school shootings. So that is just, and I mean, most polls are like 40, 50%, 60%. This is 82% number one rated for all Generation Z want school shootings finished. So there's got to be a solution that we come together and figure this out at all levels of government. We've got to cut the red tape and all sit in the same room and figure it out. Thank you for letting me say that, sir. I would love for any questions that you have also. Yeah, I mean, um, obviously you're quite passionate, and uh, we, we would have done this on video, but the, um, are you familiar with Moms Demand Action? Um, I, I actually heard about that, and I would love to connect with them if there's some way you could utilize that connection. Yeah, um, you know, definitely afterwards. Um, but uh, this T-shirt that I have actually says "Disarm Hate," <laughs> and it's a T-shirt that uh, stuck with me um, somewhat recently from Moms Demand Action. Um, the Moms Demand Action group, the, everything that I know about them, they've also done the March for Our Lives a couple of times. It was out of the uh, the school shooting that happened down in South Florida uh, years ago. And you're talking really, about the uh, the, par the Parkland shooting. I believe so, yeah. Mm. Okay, yes, sir. And so um, they are really good at, well, <laughs> you know, we're, we're two guys here. And everything that I've done in working in politics, sometimes, it, and I, I don't do this on purpose, but there is this kind of, I'll say, bro-speak way to say some of this stuff. And then there's a, um, uh, you have like the Moms Demand Action groups. And I'm fully on board with everybody, but there have been some times along the way that us coming across as men um, have a different delivery method or a different way of coming across. And it's been very interesting over you know, the years that I've been working in these political you know, arenas, um, how that plays out. But um, definitely you are, um, you know, as you were going through all of your points there, I did jot down a couple of notes. And it is interesting that you say homeschooling is not the option. I agree. I, um, uh, when I've, uh, I'm a product of all public Georgia schools from kindergarten all the way through my associates, bachelors, and masters. So my master's degree um, is from uh, Southern Polytechnic, which is now Kennesaw State. And the number one reason that I got that master's degree was to be able to go back and teach college. And I did that a couple of times. Um, That's so awesome, I've, man. Yeah. And so I work in IT, and I'm not you know, looking for anybody to pat on me on the back. It's just that I've you know, gravitated back to education you know, over the years and what have you. But I, I will um, bring up the story because I think it's somewhat relevant. Um, and I don't think it's happened here in Georgia, but there are other states or areas, or maybe, I have to double check, you may know, are they potentially arming um, grade school teachers right now here in Georgia? Well, what, what I've found is uh, Cobb County recently um, approved teachers to go through a mandatory training program that supposedly is equal to the police program. But the point is, is if you're not used to getting shot at like a police officer is, even no matter how much the training you have, your fight or flight kicks in and you're not going to be able to have the muscle memory of repeat after repeat training that from years and years of building up that, that you're going to react in the way that, that a SWAT team member would. I don't care how many years of being a, a father or a man that you might have shooting a gun at a range or hunting for deer or something. It's not the same, same thing as when somebody is shooting an AR-15 at your head. You know, it's, it's a completely different situation. And when we're putting the teachers in that situation, now on top of that, you have an armed teacher that could potentially lose control of that weapon at the school at some point from a student. 
And they're not, like I said, they went to school to educate children. And if we want to, like a lot of the reason Georgia has such a problem of, of retaining their teachers is because the teachers are scared to death. They don't want to go to school and be shot at. And I don't blame them. And the point is, no matter how much it costs or what the, 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 the financial long-term penalty is for our society to secure schools, they're going to remain a soft target. And the difference between a soft target and a hard target means how much resistance they have from the outside. And I think that putting a police officer in front of schools will deter 99% of these people. They're not going to go and engage immediately with a shootout with an armed officer. They want to go somewhere where they're going to have time to do their evil. They want time to kill as many people as possible. That's what their, their goal is, and they're going to approach the softest target available. Now, it, um, as far as homeschooling is concerned, the other thing that people don't think about, oh, they say, okay, well, I'm just going to homeschool my child. Well, now, instead of two parents being able to earn a living and a, and a career, you've got one parent because somebody has to stay home or you have to hire a nanny. And I don't think that a quality upbringing is the same with a nanny as it is with their, their biological parent because, you know, basically someone else is raising, raising your child. And there's nothing wrong with that. I understand a lot of families need to do that. But my point is that, 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 that both parents should have the opportunity to pursue the career that they want and be happy in their own life, not just having to take care of a child all day because they're scared to let them go to public school. And then a lot of parents don't have the money to put their kids in private school, even if they wanted to. So, you know, the retention of teachers would increase dramatically if we have police outside of every school, because they would be able to go to work and, and teach these kids for a very low pay already without risking their life. You know, you can't just have teachers sitting out there as victims the same way, just like the kids were. I mean, these women and men that are teachers have dedicated their life to education which is a very honorable thing to do because they already have accepted the fact that they're never going to be millionaires by being a teacher, you know, and everyone wants to be rich and have a safe life and live in relative security and not have to look over their shoulder all the time or wonder, you know, is this my last day at work at school because some crazy person comes onto campus with a gun, you know, and I think also, you know, this whole thing with, with, with everybody fighting about gun control and stuff, like, that's not the issue we're trying to attack. I'm trying to – I don't want to take anyone's guns. I just want to put a police officer in front of every school that can sit there and say, don't come up here. No matter how many guns you own, don't step foot on this property. And that's – you know, that right there, to me, you know, would, would also employ a lot of police officers that maybe are right now security guards. Or what if they're a retired military service person that was in one of the five branches of the military and they just recently retired from that? They could be a school resource officer. Or what if you had a way that, that, that like Parent Safety Alliance, we have an app in design right now that will pair a, a police officer that has post-training, which is the certification you have to have to arrest somebody. It's P-O-S-T if you look it up. Um, every officer that has the post-training can arrest someone on site and detain them legally. And that's what we need. We don't just need someone with guns, like a security guard. You have to be able to arrest the person and detain them. Also, if, say, a police officer was had his day off and he wasn't working for the county, well, he could register with the Parent Safety Alliance app, and that would pair him with the nearest school, elementary school, church, or daycare that doesn't have anybody at work that day as a security person. And they would get extra money for their family, which every police officer needs, and then the school would have somebody there sitting out front in their police car with their uniform on waiting. And hopefully they won't ever have to engage with anybody. It would be the easiest side job there is and all they get to do is wave at little kids all day, I mean, I wish I could do that, you know? I mean, it sounds like the only time they would even have an issue is if somebody's crazy enough to engage with a police officer right off the bat. And, these, like, again, I'm going to go back to the, mo the motive with these guys. Their M.O. is they approach someone and, so and a campus that does not have a police officer there. And if you notice with Uvalde, the guy came to the school three or four times from out of town to, to, to scope the school out and make sure – there wasn't a police officer there. That's how much of a coward that kid was. So, and, and all of this could have been prevented if we'd screened their social media. Same with the kid that shot up the parade on July 4th. He posted a bunch of stuff on social media, including the parade route. So, 
you know, all of this kind of stuff. The police had been to his house like 20-something times before that. I mean, I don't understand how someone is allowed to, to have visits from police officers on a regular basis like that and not be flagged, you know? I mean, all of this stuff is insane that people just overlook these obvious signs. You know, I mean, whose job is it to, take, to say something? We need to set up a reward system. Where, where students are rewarded if they if they if they tattle on a kid that has a gun at school, we need to have a reward system that 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 gives a financial or a gift card or some free gas or some kind of food gift card or something to any child that notifies the administration of uh, uh, like a kid that might have something they're not supposed to in their backpack. I mean, it doesn't have to be just a gun. It could be a knife. It could be an explosive. It could be. Uh, nunchucks. It could be Chinese stars. I mean, there's a million things I had growing up as a kid that aren't allowed in school. It could be a lighter. It could be, you know, a gas can with gasoline in it. There's a million things that these kids do. Yeah, when I was you know? in school, it was a beep. It was a beeper when I was in school. So, yeah. <laughs> dude, but but my point is, is if you incentivize yeah. these children, if you incentivize them to to see something and say something and not just expect them to do it just because, I bet you they will. Because they want to be safe too, you know. The kids, the the other students at the school are just as terrified as we are. And then the other thing that I wanted to mention is a lot of schools in my county have trailers outside that are mobile classrooms, and they sit right next to the freaking road, bro. I mean, 20 feet away from the cars going 80 miles an hour. What would stop somebody from parking their car in the street for a couple minutes and just spraying those trailers down with whatever machine gun they have? And then driving off, the bullets would go right through the walls of those trailers into our children because the trailers are like tin cans. There's yeah. nothing to them. So why don't, my proposal is to put decorative planters and like you know like 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 that have gravel and, and, and dirt in them, and have them built up around the trailer so they look nice and they're 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 aesthetically pleasing, but it would absorb any kind of projectile that's shot from the, the outside of the school campus. You know, or you could put cladding on the walls of the trailer that, that's decorative. It looks like some kind of cool pattern or maybe a sign that has the school name on it or their mascot or something like that. Or it could have the scoreboard from the football game. Or, you know, there's a million things, ways to do it. But it wouldn't be just a thin wall that, you know, is supposed to protect our children from outside bad actors. I mean, you know, there's a lot of stuff that's easy to do. You could allow these planters to be like a science project for the kids where they could plant flowers or grow vegetables or stuff they could serve in the, in the cafeteria. I mean, it, it's just endless possibilities, dude. And planters aren't the only way to do it. I mean, you could have, like, decorative fountains or sculptures or some kind of, you know, like, like uh, sandboxes or something that, that the kids could create stuff with, like, kinetic sand or, like, I mean, there's a million ways to have these, these things around the trailers outside. And it won't look like a jail or like a, you know, a prison. It'll be, be, you know, aesthetically pleasing and match the, the decor of the school. Yeah. You know, because right now you can walk right up to this. There's this one elementary school next to my house. You could literally get out of your car and walk up to the classroom door up the ramp where the trailer is in 30 seconds. And no one would stop you. There's no one to even see you. It's, you know, I mean, it's nuts. And I know that other parents are concerned about the trailers. So, you For know. sure, I mean. If, if a tornado comes, I mean, they evacuate the trailers anyway. I mean, it's it's very clear but, yeah, and it's exactly. unfortunate. Yeah. They, exactly. They want them to go inside where they're protected, right? Yeah. The common sense tells me, you know, and I don't know how much of an expense it would be to do that, but I think that each school can host a fundraiser to get, you know, materials and the dirt and the fertilizer and the plants and all that from like the local hardware stores and the Home Depots and the Lowe's and stuff. I know they would love to give stuff like that to the schools. You know, it could just be like their excess inventory that is left over from a big shipment that nobody bought, you know, or, you know, some flowers that are going out of season or, you know what I mean? And you could even use silk flowers if you don't want to maintain the flowers. You could use plastic ones. You know, and, the, and I was even thinking that the containers that the planters are made of could be like recycled tires or recycled you know, wood pallets or recycle, you know, you can take a wood pallet and break it down and use that wood to build the planters. Yeah. You know, I mean, you can make it like an economical project as well as an environmentally safe project and teach the kids about that the whole time, sustainability, using raw materials that would have otherwise gone to landfill. 
You know, I mean, there's a million ways to implement good, being a good human and a good, you know, citizen along with the safety. So your, your parents are not just expecting the government to throw away money. We can use recycled materials or materials that are free that would otherwise be waste to do some of this stuff. And it would take a supervisor or a person at the school to maintain a safe environment building all these things, of course, you know, but the kids could be involved in that. You could teach them a craft of carpentry or gardening. You know, the, the kids could learn about plants and stuff. I mean, it's a million ways to do it, bro. You know, like, I, I, I just don't understand why we don't think outside the box. You know, the answer to everything is not having an armed cop sitting there. That's just one piece of it. You know, every exterior door at a school needs to have a little auto-close actuator. You know, like you see at a government building, it pulls the door closed so nobody can prop it open. You know, they should have those at every school. So if somebody leaves the door open, it automatically yanks it shut or it notifies somebody in the front office, hey, the door in the back is open. You know, it's so simple, dude. Like those life alert bracelets that old people wear, if they're by by themselves, that has a 3G network, the old cell network, that operates wirelessly. We could put one of those around every teacher's neck. As soon as you see somebody, press that button. It tells the police officer a GPS location of what you're at, what classroom you're in. You know, the whole, you can have the whole list of the kids' names and the, you know, all that. Why don't all of our kids have RFID badges the way that, like, corporate workers have? When you go in inside of your workplace, it beeps every time you walk in and out of this door. It knows what floor you're on. It knows if you're not on, on its work when you're supposed to be. Why can't all our kids have that? That way, if junior, junior's not in, you know, social studies in third period, we know. It would el- eliminate skipping. It would eliminate having to take attendance. It would eliminate knowing whether or not somebody is, 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 you know, not where they're supposed to be or if there's a group of kids in the bathroom smoking or doing some drugs or something, you would know because the thing would tell you, wait, why is there four kids in the, in the bathroom and class already started? You know? I mean, it's a, it would lead the security guards up to do what they're supposed to be doing and not worrying about the kids' mischief. Yeah, right? Sure. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's crazy. We have security guards and they don't perform security duties. Why are you even there? You know, like the Board of Education here in Atlanta. My name is Dr. Tinsley. If you, there was a recent article in the, in the uh, AJC where she added 20 SRO officers to the network. Okay, and I thanked her when I spoke at the Board of Education meeting. If you go online at the city of Shambly, Doraville, Brookhaven, uh, uh, Decatur, you can look at um, – uh, the Board of Education for DeKalb County, I've spoken at all these meetings and expressed my pro- the issues, but they only give me three freaking minutes to talk. That's it. Yeah. And they kick you out. I mean, and I was actually going to ask, I was, I was going to ask, you know, what kind of reaction are you getting? So even though, I mean, you know, they, they limit the, uh, the speaking, but what kinds of reaction are you getting both from these they, boards they, of they, 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 they basically said, thank you for, for uh, your material, Mr. Rodler. Please leave it and we'll review it. So what I did is just email the hell out of them. Yeah. At night when my kids are sleeping, I just email everybody. I'm talking about the governor, the lieutenant governor, all the senators, all the House of Representatives for Georgia, the Board of Education for both the state and the county. I'm emailing the crap out of people. So finally, they're, and I'm just going to annoy them until they do what I'm telling them to, which they should have been doing from the beginning. And I, ta- I reminded the Board of Education that they're, they are elected officials. And I will, I will start a movement and a petition to have them removed if they don't react to this soon. And I am not joking. So I got a call last week from Jima, the chief of uh, emergency management, and he has, has finally started to work with me. And he says he's going to rile all of the other chiefs together and have some type of uh, communication with me because I think they're finally starting to realize that I'm not joking. I mean, I'm talking about the biggest lawsuit in the history of DeKalb County will be filed if they don't get something together. Because as soon as one shooting happens around here, under their watch, the blood is on their hands. Because we've been asking and begging for them to fix this. And, and, and uh, the chief of uh, the schools for the Board of Education right now for DeKalb County told me on the phone that there is zero coverage at elementary schools. And so that's every elementary school in DeKalb County has no police there. That is nuts. 
those are the, mo- the most innocent kids there are. Daycare kids and, 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 and kindergarten through, what is it, K, K through 5? I mean, that's nuts, dude. Yeah. It blows my mind. And the well, only the, reason they have the resource officers at the middle school and high schools is to watch the students. They're not worried about outside threats. And what I was going to ask, you know, as you were able to make these connections with elected officials, um, you know, the, all of the, you know, strategy I've done over the, the years and, and working with them is trying to clue in on not necessarily the elected officials, but the staffers, anybody that happens to respond to you. That's great, you know, that the uh, the GEMA guy is, you know, responding to you. But another angle that I was thinking about as you were going through this, what about campaign contributions from gun makers to elected officials and going to well, the gun makers yep. and saying, um, wait a minute, you gave X number of dollars to candidate John Doe. Um, we need to sit down and change the narrative. Can, can, I, can, I, can, I, can I tell you, can I tell you my response to that? I feel like I'm going to lose a lot of support if I try to even dip my hands into gun control because I, I, I'm a, a, a concealed carry proponent myself. I, can't, I have a license to carry a gun. I carry one everywhere I go if my wife and kids are with me. And I'm not joking. I have two or three of them on me but, or in the car at all times. But, that's but understand because, them. I, yeah. And, I understand and that's where you're coming from. Of the climate but. and the environment that we're in right now, these crazy folks, you can't even go to the grocery store without carrying a gun. And yeah. the, the more people that are allowed to carry a gun now, because the governor Kemp, uh, allows concealed carry now without a license, which I don't approve, because I had to go through six months of background checking just to keep get mine. And now people don't even need a license. That makes me angry because of all the, the, the research they did on my past just to let me have my guns weapon license. Yeah. So, and so my, my, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to repeat what I – is consider changing the narrative here. What we can't stop – contributions, but you can get in the middle of this. You can. This is all public record. You can see who contributed to who and, and the amounts and everything and go to the gun makers and say, hey, here, is your, here are your talking points. If you're going to continue to create these destructive devices and sell them um, you know, to Americans, um, you need to start changing the narrative. And when you get for, you know, to meet with these elected officials, because elected officials meet with people that give them money, <laughs> FYI. <laughs> that's, um, sad. It, it, that's sad, isn't it? You have to buy their time? Oh, yeah. But, again, this is not going to change in the amount of time that we're on this call. But you can get in front of them and say, wait a minute, most people – you know, we're not going to stop selling of guns in America at any time soon, unfortunately. But these gun makers and the NRA and all these folks can change the narrative, and they can actually get in front of these elected officials and say, this is how this needs to go down if you're going to continue. Well, to I'll, can I tell you an idea I have about that? Mm-hmm. Say, okay, I'm in aviation, right? Like my, my background is I'm an engineer, uh, airframe and power plant for, you know, repairing and uh, mechanic work on air, aircraft. And like in, the, in my spare time, I'm trying to achieve my pilot's license. I've only got about 13 hours in the air right now. Uh-huh. And I always have to fly with an instructor. But I was thinking, why don't we make long guns and high-powered weapons the way that a pilot's license is? Like if you want to learn to fly, you start out with a person with you, and you're in a Cessna, single-engine prop plane. And as you get hours and they trust you, meaning the FAA, then you can fly a double, a, a, a double prop, and then you can do a turboprop. And then after you get 200 hours, you can fly a jet. But the whole time, there's someone with you that's already licensed. It's not like driving a car where here you drive it for six months or a year and that you learn license, and now you can do it by yourself. So you get a long-term monitoring program, and you build the safety aspect of it and the, 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 the privilege, which is it can't be a right. It has to be a privilege to own anything more than a self-defense weapon. You make it to where, yeah, you can own this till you F up. And once you do that, we're taking it, right? Yeah, well, and then on top of that, I agree with you, but on top of that, it also boggles my mind that we all have to have insurance to drive cars, but there's nothing that says you have to insure a gun. And then the other thing I wanted to mention is when these kids access these weapons, we need to put the parents in jail because all the guns at my house are in a locked wall safe that's bolted to the floor and you have to have a key and a fingerprint to get in it. So if I've got my key or my hand is nowhere near that thing, 
there's no way my kids can access any of my weapons. So if Junior is at school or, a, you know, God knows a little girl got a hold of a gun somehow, but you notice this is always boys that do it, um, you know, where is his parents at? Why doesn't that person get charged with the school violence also? Because it's grossly negligent to leave a loaded weapon or access to that around for any child, regardless of who purchased it legally or not. So my, my point with this is as you are engaging with you know, elected officials, their staffers, et cetera, consider that angle as well. If, if a person is going to choose to have guns out in their home, in their vehicle, not, you know, it, it's a, to, to get, tell me an insurance company that is going to insure that person. They're probably well, now in Atlanta, all of the school break, the uh, car break-ins, all they want is the gun out of the car. They don't even care about the iPod or the phone or the purse or any of that, the credit card. They leave it sitting there. They break the window and take the gun. That the guns are so desirable for thieves and people that can't legally buy one. I yeah. mean, right now, you can go downtown Atlanta and find an illegal weapon easily if you have cash. Not that I would ever do that, but, I mean, it's real. And the, 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 what's fueling that in, is because people leave their cars unlocked or their vehicles accessible, and the, the, a lot of people leave their weapon in their glove box or under their seat. And it's not locked in the valet thing in the trunk or something like it should be. Yeah. So we um, we went through uh, the reactions. I, I would, again, challenge you to hold the, uh, and it's something that I've been doing or trying to do for years, is hold the elected officials accountable. The, these elected officials, they wanted these positions allegedly, but why are they not responding when you are approaching them? Um, so I, I, you know, kudos to you for, um, you know, doing all you can. And then again, um, I, I have seen it in corporate uh, uh, venues where you got a corporation that is giving thousands and thousands of dollars to these elected officials and they get first priority. When you call the elected official, someone is actually there Johnny on the spot because unfortunately that's the way campaign finance works in America. Well, I was so, hoping that we have uh, the change.org petition. If you go to change.org, Parent Safety Alliance has one that says fully equip police outside of all schools, churches, and uh, crowded events, and if we could get to 100,000 signatures, then I can legally uh, force the state of Georgia to put that on the ballot in November to where the voters can ask for that law to be voted on by the by the governing, by the House of uh, Representatives and the Senate. So yeah. if, and, and if Governor Kemp wants to be reelected, which, you know, I think he's doing a good job, however, Stacey Abrams has got a lot of people too, and I like I consider myself to be more of an independent just because I like some things that both parties are doing. And I, I don't necessarily care as much who the person is that gets elected as long as they're taking care of our children priority. All that other stuff that they're fighting over can take a back seat to the kids' safety. I mean, school safety to me is just paramount. And I understand that some elected officials maybe can't say that, but I think they feel the same way also. And Commissioner Robert Patrick here in DeKalb County, I didn't realize this until I was halfway into this battle, but his kids go to my kid's school also, which is, you know, a private school in DeKalb. And I, once I realized his kids went there, then I realized why he's helping. You know, and, and Commissioner Patrick, I have to give him kudos. He's, he's been fighting for me on the inside, but there's only so much he can do. You know, the, the way that the bureaucracy is, 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 is stacked, and, and, and the order is, is, is uh, on purpose. It is very deliberate the way that they have the hierarchy of elected officials to where you have to go through multiple departments to get a decision made. That prevents any one person from approving anything. And all of them have their own pet projects and their own uh, little, little uh, agenda that they're promoting on the back end and their own political aspirations that are beyond child and kid safety at schools. But I will tell you something interesting. Uh, Dr. Tinsley did an interview with the AJC that I mentioned earlier. At the very end of the interview, if you look it up, they asked her, was she uh, planning on staying with DeKalb County? 
And she replied, no. And that's what I, that that's a telltale sign that if the superintendent, the interim superintendent, doesn't want to stay long term with DeKalb County, why is she even our superintendent? Why is her heart not in it? Get her the hell out of there and put somebody in there that really wants to be in that job. Because if your heart's not in it, you're not going to do a good job anyway. It makes no sense to me that the leader of our county education system publicly admits she doesn't want to remain in that position. I mean, what is going on? For sure. So um, speaking of, before we uh, don't forget to do this, how can folks get in touch with you and or your organization? Well, we're on Facebook at Parent Safety Alliance. Uh, we're in the process of incorporating as a 5013C, so that, and we'll have a donation account at Navy, Navy Federal Credit Union that people can donate through our website, which is parentsafetyalliance.org. That is also under uh, construction now to have a really nice modern website that is fully interactive. Um, we also have an app in construction through the same company that built the Uber app and the Facebook app for online interactions with your phone for both of those websites. And it's going to be the KidSafe app, which is, like I was telling you before, is going to pair schools that are unmanned or unguarded with an off-duty police officer or post-certified security officer that that day can do a side job. With, and there'll be uh, like a geofence set up around that each person so that they'll be at the nearest school that's vacant. Um, further, we're going to have the, uh, a lot of uh, things in the app that are going to be uh, safety features for kids and parents. And then we're having a big meeting at the downtown Decatur Square, which is the old historic courthouse. It looks like a big castle right in the middle of downtown Decatur on August 30th. It has free parking. We have free food, free child care. There's a big meeting room that you can see photos of online on, on our website, and we're going to host it from 6 p.m. till 8 p.m. And I've got uh, the commissioner's office, uh, Senator Warnock. Uh, I've got uh, the lieutenant governor. Jeff, uh, Jeff, uh, what's his last? Duncan. Jeff Duncan is going to uh, attend virtually, and then the superintendent, uh, his commit, the commissioner for our area is uh, uh, Mr. Trenton is going to attend, uh, and then I have the GEMA and the DEMA, which is Georgia Emergency Management Agency and the Cal Emergency Management, A Management Agency, that is going to send their chiefs either in person or uh, virtually, so that we can really start to get some stuff done. But I need help, man. I desperately need people to sign our change.org uh, petition and people to join our Facebook page and come to that meeting. The more people that show up to that meeting in person, we have room for 300 people in this meeting room. It's, it's an old uh, courthouse with the, in the main judges' chamber is where we're meeting at. And we've got all the nice seats set up. We've got great food. I believe Chick-fil-A is going to cater it, the Decatur location. We're uh, in talks with them now, and we're going to have uh, refreshments. And like I said, child care will have uh, a bunch of toys and coloring books and stuff for the kids in the room next to where we're meeting at. And there'll be a certified daycare person there to take care of them. So, you know, you know, from 6 to 8, you can come as a parent and, and interact with our meeting, and you'll be able to ask these officials questions directly live. And it'll be uh, streamed on our Facebook and Zoom, and then we're also going to record it. Yeah, and just because uh, uh, it may have uh, glitched when you said it, this is Tuesday, uh, August 30th, right? Tuesday, August 30th at the downtown Decatur Courthouse, not the one that they use now, the old one. It's, a, it's the DeKalb History Center is the official name of it. It looks like a big castle, like original courthouse from like the 1800s. Um, it's right in the middle of Decatur Square. It's all big granite building. It's real beautiful, and you go upstairs to where the main area is. There's a museum downstairs that tells you all the history of Decatur. And then upstairs, it has uh, all of the, the places where we're meeting. And like I said, free food, free uh, refreshments, and child care. And then parking is free after 6 p.m. So as long as you get there at 6 or later, we're going to start the Zoom meeting at 6.30. And I can email you and post on our – there's a post on our Facebook page with that link, which is facebook.com Parents Safety Alliance. Yeah, and definitely we'll have time to get this episode out to talk about it before then too, so sure. Um, one other thing. I, I really, um, really appreciate your help, man. Yeah, doing all we can. But uh, one other thing too. Once you get the C3 formed, um, remember that uh, corporations will, um, large corporations will generally match those contributions. So just remember that when you get the C3 form. Oh, that's a great piece of advice. Awesome. 
So how can we collaborate in the future again? Is there any way I could be uh, on your show after our big meeting to give updates or anything again? I mean, not to be like pushy or anything, but I really appreciate this. <laughs> no, no, sure, sure. And actually, um, you know, we'll connect offline, and I can give you some other uh, connections possibly that. Uh, and then the other thing I wanted is feedback from your listeners. Like, can they somehow comment on what we talked about and the stuff I said? And, and like, even if it's constructive criticism or if they agree, you know, I would love to, all of that. I want everyone included. I want all the viewpoints. I don't want anybody to feel like just because I'm, you know, a, a middle-aged white man in Atlanta that I don't want to include everyone else, dude. I, I mean, this, like I said before, is a unifying, uh, a unifying cause, and everyone has children. And I want – there's no one getting left out of this. Oh, for sure. I mean, that, that's always been my concern is every, everything I've done with politics is making sure what are we missing? What's the blind side? So I, I am fully on board. And um, I do have Twitter, Facebook, um, and then some of the platforms that this will go out like to you, uh, there are abilities to comment for sure. Oh, our, our, our Twitter is a PSA for the cab. Mm -hmm. And yep. then I think our Instagram is Parent Safety Alliance also. Yeah. I gotta ask my wife. She does all that. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. Yeah. All right, so uh, we'll get this I'm wrap up. Old dude. Oh, I hear What's you. What's that? Yeah, I hear you. So, um, yeah, just to wrap this up, is there anything else you want to get in on the episode here? Uh, yeah, I'm gonna be speaking tomorrow at 12 o'clock at the Atlanta City Council meeting. It's the biggest one so far. Um, it, like if you if your listeners want to view the videos from the other uh, times that I spoke regarding Parent Safety Alliance on the record and public record. It's at the the Cal Board of Education. Um, it's at Shambly, Doraville, Brookhaven. Uh, um, I'm leaving some out. Um, and then also tomorrow, the Atlanta City Council. And um, if we could also get people to come to the meeting August 30th, that is absolutely imperative. We're going to actually have the Cal and Georgia officials on the on the Zoom call or in person. So this is and, and including Senator Warnock. I mean. His office, and then Anthony Sabatini, I forgot to mention this earlier, Florida has a guardian program that they, after the Parkland shooting that they implemented where the state has a line item in their budget every year to, to refresh the program funding-wise and to make sure that every school has a person that's trained and vetted guarding the school, even if it's not a police officer, and that includes all uh, military and, and veterans and uh, former law enforcement. So if there's anybody in the city of Atlanta or Georgia that wants to help us, we would love to have you guys registered in the Parent Safety Alliance app to be a, uh, a certified security guard for outside the schools whenever the police can't be there. All right, very good. Well, uh, thanks, Kyle, again for um, you know, taking the time out, and we'll, we'll get this published definitely in time for your event. Um, anything else you want to get in on the episode before we wrap up? Uh, how, often, how often do you do a podcast? Because I would, I would love to listen to it more often. It's um, hit and miss. Um, I've got some guys who try to do something monthly. I'll send you the link to our uh, Dixie Dems. Um, you may want to uh, may want to do that sometime. But it's it's hit and miss. Um, sometimes it's um, I've done two this week. Sometimes I'll go a couple of weeks. So it's not regular. Well, if, so if you ever need other people to talk about this, I could probably get some of the officials from uh, DeKalb County or Georg or the state of Georgia or the Board of Education to talk with you or okay. with us. We could have them as a guest. And that'd be awesome to really have. You know, so if you could get some feedback from your listeners from this podcast, to ask them at the next one. All right, very good. Yep. All right, well, uh, thanks for taking the time out. we got a little bit more of the weekend left here or on Saturday afternoon, but uh, try to enjoy what's left, and uh, we'll be in touch for sure. Hey, man, thank you for your time, and I really appreciate the opportunity to speak to your listeners. Yep. Talk to you soon. Yeah.